But tonight our special guest is Mr. Kendall Qualls here. And I'm going to read uh, my, my, uh, the bio here that I have for him. And uh, Kendall grew up in the tough projects of Harlem, New York. Then he served as an artillery officer in the Army. He fought his way into the business world, serving in leadership positions for several Fortune 100 companies. Kendall and his wife, Sheila, have been married for 35 years and have five beautiful children. There are a lot of St. Paul insiders in the race. That's not Kendall. He's a strong conservative, a proud supporter of Donald Trump, and doesn't back down. He's ready to fight the career politicians and get our freedoms back. Let's give a nice mask off and a sort of welcome to Kendall Qualls. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. You know, this couldn't be something more important right now than the health of our, our families, um, our health, how we, what decisions we make. You know, when we win this in November, one of the things I want to do is do an audit on what actually happened during this COVID period, what decisions were made based on what data. Because we trusted in what they called the medical science, but somewhere along the way, we moved from the medical science to the political science. And I'll give you an example. Um, one, of the th one of the things I've told a lot of Republicans, whenever they catch a governor of another state, a Democratic governor or senator, don't call them hypocritical, because that's not it. We're missing the boat. It's not hypocritical. They know that COVID is really a, uh, is fatal to people that um, are compromised, have you know, underlying complications, and, this, and senior citizens. But for the vast majority of Americans, it's not. They don't, want you to, they don't want you to know that they know that it's not. Because if they thought this was a deadly virus, that they were susceptible to it, they'd be in complete hazmat suits, right? And we'd probably be in the mask. Um, if they thought it was that severe, and they take off their mask at dinings you know, in private settings, so they can be comfortable and live a normal life, it's because they know it's not that critical. It is for those people, that, as I mentioned before. So let me kind of give you an idea and as far as how I live my life and all of this thing that we're talking about, the overreach of government. What you're doing here is spot on, but it's analogous to everything they're doing along down the road. They're doing it in the armed forces with critical race theory. They're pushing this man, all these government overreach in our schools. This is just one of many. This is why we need to coalesce together as Minnesotans and Americans. Let me just tell you a little bit how I got out of the circumstances I, I, I was born in and um, how I got here, and I'll open it up for questions. But it, it all starts with the, all the values and everything else that we grew up with. A lot of what our grandparents have told us, our parents have told us, guess what? That formula works. Give you an idea. I really shouldn't even be here tonight. Odds are that a kid born in a broken family that lived part of his life in Harlem, New York in the late 1960s with my mother in, a, in the public housing projects and then later with my father in a trailer park in Oklahoma wouldn't graduate from high school, go to college, become an army officer, raised five kids with his wife of now 36 years. And by the way, we homeschooled those kids. Oh, and by the, way, we, by the way, we adopted one of those kids. I can't remember which one because we love them all the same. Odds are that that guy would not only earn one or two, three master's degrees and then become a vice president of a major corporation, but, all, but also would become a candidate for governor of the great state of Minnesota. That story happens a lot, regardless of race. And what I promote is this idea that in this country we can live your life the way you please without asking for permission from anybody. However, they want to change that. They want, they want permission for you to live your life the way you want. That is not how this country was intended to be operated. It's not how it was founded. But they want to change that. And this is why I'm running. This is the, probably the, the most critical time in our history as a country because we're losing our rights as, as citizens, the, the more I've ever seen before. So one of the reasons I'm running. You know, um, that idea of the American dream works for anybody, I tell people, that, um, regardless of race or social standing in life. And there's a war against that, 
that idea, that promise of America. And I'll give you three examples right here in Minnesota. Minneapolis was the epicenter for all the rioting, looting, defund the police, Black Lives Matter that spread all across the country. Ilhan Omar, Keith Ellison were right in the middle of it. And our governor allowed that to happen for three days, unabated. It was just a peaceful, peaceful protest, as they called it. He let that happen for three days. Two years after that, we're still suffering from record crime. And it's, it's, it's just abysmal. W women are getting beaten in parking lots and their cars stolen. And kids are getting shot in their neighborhoods. And we never used to have that before in our country. And, and not in our country, in our state. We, never, we were never a Detroit. We were never a Chicago. And you know what the sad part about this is that in October of 2009, Forbes magazine, they rated all the major cities in the country on which, was the, which city had the highest quality of life and, the, and was the safest city. Minneapolis was on that list, and it was ranked number one. It was on the cover of the magazine, October 2009, and if we get in and we win this, we're gonna get it back in 18 months, okay? The second, the second war against this, this, uh, our state and, and that American dream is that Minnesotans have been leaving the state in record numbers. Last year um, was the highest number of Minnesotans exiting and leaving the state in 30 years. One big reason of that is not just the COVID and the crime, but it's one of the heaviest tax burdens in the country for this, this size of a state. And uh, I tell people now is not the time to turn to career politicians to tinker around the edges. We really need major tax overhaul, and we needed someone from the private sector with private sector solutions. And I bring that to the table. And then lastly, I think all of us, all of us are getting tired of the woke agenda. We, we've been bullied to no end. And this is just one example. Uh, you know, it was, it was, it's sad to see it's how many people uh, you know, just celebrated when the mask finally came off on airplanes, but the left started crying about it. They want, they want this restriction. We want freedom. We want our freedom back. And we, we get really tired of getting bullied. You know, cancel culture was never part of the American culture. And so we're going to get that back. We're going to cancel cancel culture <laughs> as soon as we get it in the administration. Second one is that the, what they're teaching in our schools is just, it's one of the most you know, repugnant things I've ever seen. They're dividing our kids purposefully around racial lines. And now they're introducing the sexual orientation that your sex is, you know, is, is not established at birth, all the while reading scores, tests, and math scores, all that are declining across the state while we're doing the social justice stuff. And if we ever say anything about election integrity, they start waving the banner of racism. And here's where I believe that the last person they want to be running on the Republican ticket is me. Because my grandparents who lived through the Jim Crow segregated South, they would have loved to have grown up in the America I grew up in. This is the least racist time in American history, and it's the least racist country in the world. But those are facts. Now, the reason it sounds so odd is because we never hear it, because the left always pounces on everything being uh, racist and always recycling this narrative in our media, in academia, and the like. And, and, and this, it's just a false narrative, and we're going to bring the truth to this, because they use that racial disparities to uh, justify their agenda. And what I've been doing for the last year and a half before I became a candidate was explaining that those racial disparities are not racial disparities. They're actually two parent disparities, okay? We don't have white privilege, we have two parent privilege. When the black community started uh, following and being, getting aligned with the Democratic Party in the mid, late 60s, that was the, its downfall. We went from 80% two parent families to 80% fatherless homes in my lifetime without one national initiative to reverse the trend because they don't want to reverse it. They want control. They've obliterated the American black family. And when you can, when you ha when you can convince people that they're fearful and they're fear and they're angry, you can control them. And unfortunately, that's what they've done. Uh, I started a um, nonprofit last year called Take Charge Minnesota. I went back and I went into the black community and said, look, we didn't used to live like this. God did not intend 
for women to raise children alone. I started with that one statement. It's not political, it's cultural. A lot of heads nodding up and down. What we did, not knowing anyone in that, in that community, we started and we recruited the largest number of volunteers that st basically state that they denounce critical race theory, denounce Black Lives Matter, they call for a need to get back to the basics of the culture, of the black culture, faith, family, and education. So this is very analogous to the Dennis Prager video library. We've got the largest number of black Americans in the country, right here in the Twin Cities, on that platform, Take Charge Minnesota, and it just come in there with truth and leading and solving real problems to get families back together. That's the biggest issue we have. So here's what I tell people. Look, I've been a Republican since I was 18 years old, and I never looked back. Okay? Everything I achieved in my life is because of two things, my Christian faith in this country I love and adore that I'll fight to the nail for. And I felt like I needed to get off the couch and help do something because, to be quite honest, I'm really tired of Ron DeSantis having all the fun. <laughs> okay? It's time to bring some freedom and some liberty to Minnesota. And it's high time, and we're going to do it. And I want Ron DeSantis to say, what the heck is going on up there in Minnesota? Okay? We need to go on the offense and do it in a way that reminds people what it means to be Americans. We've lost that identity. It's gone dormant inside of us. And I tell people, you know, uh, one of the things to be remindful of our national anthem, this is the land of the free and home of the brave. And it's high time we start acting like it. So as I, as I conclude, I want you to know, look, I, um, I took an oath when I was 19 years old as a young lieutenant in Army Reserves, I'm still in college. I took an oath and said that um, I'm going to defend the Constitution against enemies foreign and domestic. That oath has no expiration date. I'm activating it now because our country needs it, our state needs it, and we're going to get our country and we're going to get our state back. Thank you. So, so I want to make sure that you guys understand that there's some tangible things related to what I plan on doing. I have it on our website, clear accountability. We have six action items in six months. It's on the issues tab of our website, kq4mn.com. And I'm just going to go run through the, the six and I'll open it up for questions. So number one, which just happens to be there, and, this is, it's, been, and it's been there from day one, um, no mask mandates, no vaccine mandates. Any state agency or department that tries to force that will get their funds re revoked. Okay. Number two, I'm, as I mentioned, we're going to get our we're going to get our city back. You know, we're going to address this crime problem. I I, I put on there right when, in February, right when I put it out there, we're going to hire three to four hundred law enforcement officers at the state level, and have them organized in the task force and deployed in the Twin Cities. I got hammered for saying that. Well, you can't do that. You you know you know someone from the city council. You can't do that. And some of my opponents were like, oh, well, that's easy for you to say. You just can't, just because you say it, that don't mean you can do it. Well, anyway, I stuck, up, stuck with my guns, because leadership is principle. This is what we're going to do. We're going to get our cities back. If they can do it in New York City, pre-Giuliani, post-Giuliani, we can do it in the Twin Cities. Well, just last weekend, I, read, I was reading a Star Tribune report where the governor is reallocating state troopers and his state uh, investigative units and getting them redeployed into the Twin Cities. I was going, that sounds like a great idea. Wonder where you got it. And, and, I, and I say that sarcastically because you know what happened? This was back in September. There were 50 families in Minnesota that wrote an open letter to the governor. Governor, please help us. Our communities, our neighborhoods are being overrun with violence, gunfire. Please help us. Send the state troopers, send, send National Guard. They sent that. A week later, he responded, sorry, can't help you. Now that it's election year, he's trying to do patchwork where we're redeploying these state officers. And they're only there for three to four days. I'm going to hire three to 400, and they're going to be there full time. Number three, we're going to do, I, I, I mentioned tax code, re, significant reductions. You, you'll see the actual tax rates, personal, as well as business. We're going to eliminate the Social Security tax, as well as the state tax. It's already on there. It's called accountability. Okay, transparency, that's what leaders do. Number four, emergency powers. We can severely restrict emergency powers. W whatever the legislature brings, whether it's a 30 day for the governor, or 10 days, or seven days, or one day, or zero. 
I'm going to sign the most restrictive uh, emergency powers, the history of the state, not just for myself, but any governor that follows. Now, there are people that have been hammering me because they're saying that Kimmel doesn't stand for, you know, for emergency powers. Well, yes, I do. But here's the, here's the issue. There's an organization that says, look, I want you to sign our pledge that, you're, that this is what you would do when you're in office. I said, I'm not, I'm not contracting out my, my oath or my credibility. My oath and credibility is directly to you, the voters. If it was good enough for me to swear an oath as, as an Army officer, put my, line, put my life on the line, then that's, I want to make sure that connection is between the bo both of us. I'm not contracting that out to a third party. And so they got, you know, they got all kind of wound up tight about me not signing their document. And now that we're surging in the polls, it's hammer, hammer time on this thing. There's only two candidates have signed it. I'm getting hammered because I'm, uh, I'm the front runner. But trust me, it's, on, it's my pledge to restrict those powers are on our website. We're going to hold it accountable. The next thing is empowering parents with school choice. Where the dollars go, where the, where the child goes, the dollars aren't going to go. And we're looking at roughly between eight to $10,000. We're not sure yet on the amount of money, but that money will go to help offset the cost. Parents need to make the best decisions for their children. There used to be a collaboration with our schools. Basically, what we hear from the school districts now and the teachers union is stiff, you know, it's a stiff arm. You know, what, once you drop these kids off at the door, they're ours. I don't think so. And there has been a huge disenfranchise between parent and, and school systems that we need to reestablish the, the balance of power. And we do that by making sure that you decide and the money then goes with them. And then we're going we're to hold them accountable on, on what's being taught. Um, no critical race theory. We need to double down on the fundamentals. We're getting, we're getting left behind in the world of competition internationally. We need to focus back on the fundamentals. And then, um, then lastly, election integrity. That's the last one. That's number six. Voter ID. Okay? Voter ID. Got to make sure we get that. And then until Minnesotans are comfortable with the machines that are doing the counting, we'll go back to ballots. Okay, paper ballots and manual count was good enough for our, our forefathers and forebearers and is good enough to us until people get, get comfortable with the systems that we're using from an automation standpoint. And we'll do audits and all that to validate, but until then, we'll go back to the manual count. Here's the issue. We, we have, um, there's a lot more of us and there are them. And they have the big megaphone uh, with the media, but um, I think people are getting wising up. Um, there are a lot of independent voters that um, have come out, on, you know, just on their own. I haven't even begun campaigning yet, and even some Democrats. I, I suspect that we're going to, we're, we, our campaign could win a significant amount of, you know, conserv I won't say conservative, Democrats, practical Democrats. Now, especially I'll call them the Clinton Democrats. But, I can, but here's the caveat: I can, I feel comfortable that I can get some Bill Clinton Democrats. I don't, I can't make any promises about the Hillary Clinton Democrats. <laughs> okay. With that said, ladies and gentlemen, I want to I end with this. Um, I love this country. I fought for it. My son now is serving on active duty in the Army. He's fourth generation to serve our country. Uh, we, we see that as veterans, we see the country very differently than people. Um, as, 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 as veterans, we, we, we've seen our country differently. And I, we see it as under attack, and I'm stepping forward to help save us. With that said, I'll open it up for any questions. Thank you. Yes, sir. So we actually yes, have the, the microphone up here. So if you have a, a question for Kendall, please come up this direction, ask him a question. And since I have the microphone, I'm going to ask the first question. Uh, yeah. So Kendall, what would you do? And go ahead and just line up behind me here. You know, Robbinsdale School District is, is right down the road here. And I read in the local newspaper over 50% of the graduating senior, not graduating, of the seniors are failing, have yes. a failing grade. Yes. What would you, what would the first thing that you would do to try to, you know, resolve? I know not all the school districts are struggling with like that, but some are really struggling. Yes. Back mostly due to Walls' policies of, you know, canceling school and making the kids do all this worthless virtual learning. What, what would be the first thing that you would do to help a, a district like Robbinsdale, who has over 50% of the, the seniors failing? Yeah, what, what's so tragic? So I'm on the board for, if you're familiar with Hope Academy, there's, there's a couple of um, faith-based schools in the city. So Hope Academy is one, Crystal Ray is another one. There's a few others, um, Ascension, um, 
faith-based schools, now these people that donate this money, a lot of these people that donate these, the money to help these schools, the students,